My name is Camille Weber. We are here with Harry Peterson Nedry at Shehalem Winery. It is April 15th, 2016. So my first question for you, Harry, is... is have I paid my taxes? Have you? <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> well, you have a little bit more time, but not much. Well, my first question for you is, why wine? Uh, and the natural answer is, why not? Uh, <laughs> wine became something that I was not raised with, uh, so it became a passion later. I actually did not have a drop of alcohol cross my lips until I was a senior at the university which is stupid in retrospect, but in retrospect, I've also made up for it since. Uh, I came out of the university and basically discovered during my first job and my first exploration of the real world, discovered that wine was something that fulfilled several different facets of what I think we as human beings need and I specifically wanted. It provides a measure of creativity. Uh, it uh, is both hedonistic and intellectual. Uh, it has a certain sense of even immortality. The last wine that I touch before I kick off will probably still be a very viable and interesting um, wine 30 to 40 years afterwards. So I, I think there are a lot of things both from um, the appreciation standpoint, the aesthetics, and from the technical side. I am inherently a technical person. Um, I'm a chemist by education, and you'll meet my daughter Wynne later. She's also a chemist. So we're into uh, things in a very scientific, what makes it work sort of way. Uh, it is, uh, it's, it's great when you can bring both left brain and right brain together, and I think wine does that. Well, you brought up chemistry and your background in that, but you also have a degree in English, so. Well, left brain, right brain. <laughs> exactly. Sure, why not? So can you talk about a little bit how your education, both with studying English and chemistry has helped you um, in this new endeavor? Um, it's not such a new endeavor right, at this right. point, but uh, <laughs> this is, uh, we began looking for vineyard land something like 30, almost 37 years ago, and found it not long after that. So have been in it for a while, but it's still bright and fresh, the things that both sides bring. And I've seen it redone year, uh, many times over the years where uh, the science drives things for rigor and precision and replication, um, experimentation, and then at the same time, the right brain kicks in and wants to describe it exceptionally well, to put a, um, a creative and maybe artistic patina on things. It's, uh, it's an important back and forth that I think we all need, whether, whether it's inside us as individuals or whether it's as part of a team. Many times the best team has the creative elements and the more, uh, more structured and rigorous elements. You need them both. So how did you decide that wine was going to be more of a career than a hobby? When did that switch take place? Oh my God, it's, it's just like, a, uh, uh, like quicksand. One foot in and then you never pull it out again. You get sucked in. Uh, there, there are so many facets of, of an industry like the wine industry, especially when it's in its formative stages. Mm -hmm. When I got involved in the late 70s, uh, the industry was pretty small. Uh, people like the Letts and the Eraths and uh, uh, people like that were, were basically charging ahead and leading us into an unknown land. And uh, that in itself is pretty exciting. 
it's great to be able to talk about uh, things together in a small group. Uh, I was not in the first wave of the people that I mentioned in the Sokol Blossers and the Adelsheims and kind of go down the laundry list, the Campbells, the Ponzi's. But, uh, but I was in the next phase and so I was learning pretty quickly. Uh, one of the things that I think is, is many times overlooked is the fact that the people in the first phase were themselves not gadflies or romantics off searching butterflies. Mm -hmm. They were themselves largely scientists. You look at the Letts and the ERAS and the Ponzi's. Uh, those people uh, had pretty rigorous left brain sort of, uh, sort of backgrounds. They also had reflective right brain things going on too, but uh, science and rigor have always been a necessary part of the wine business. And so it was pretty easy early on to follow these, these people into the wilderness. Uh, it's very exciting. It kept, kept me involved for a long time because there's a natural next step. First thing you do is get interested, understand and appreciate, then say, I've got to do this. For example, I was born and raised on a farm. I knew agriculture. I'm a scientist, so I, I knew the technical sides of things and specifically a chemist, so uh, the chemical side of winemaking was uh, pretty easy to understand. Um, but it, uh, it also meant that over time, uh, you got a chance to grow a business. You planted vines. You, uh, you researched what the state of the art was at the time, whether it's in grape growing or whether it's wine making. You do your own experimentation. For example, I did uh, what are called uh, statistically designed experiments, mainly because my other job in uh, high-tech manufacturing industry involves statistically designed experiments and so why not use that in this new thing I was getting involved in. So there's a natural creep into uh, a new world and each step required something new and fresh and that's pretty attractive, that's alluring. Well you talked about uh, working with some of the earlier wine pioneers and uh, how they kind of laid the foundation for the second wave uh, winemakers like uh, yourself. But how did you learn from either their successes or kind of the challenges that they faced? I, I, I think the, the main way that the Oregon industry has always learned and shared information is by working side by side with each other in collaborative efforts, whether it's marketing efforts that kind of put you together in the same room on a board that's trying to determine how you get the message out or what you do. Uh, you always share a lot of other information besides the tasky things that are right in front of you. I think we've done that exceptionally well as an industry and you know we can go down and uh, relist all of the uh, innovations really of the industry whether they're pure innovations, as in no one else anywhere in the wine industry has ever done them before, there are one or two of those, or reinvented for the Oregon industry. We do that very well as an industry, and actually still do. After 50 years, what well, last year was the 50th anniversary of the first sticks in the Willamette Valley, uh, we, we still sit down and you see a lot of gray hairs and a lot of people who are uh, uh, apple, red-cheeked, bright, fresh, new people in the industry all sitting down together and working on issues that concern the industry. Uh, at one point, I think I was on six different boards. Uh, right now, that's kind of shrunk. I think they finally decided that there's a core of us who need to be on this senior board, which means put out to, uh, put out to pasture. Um, but uh, it, it was not unusual at all for us uh, within the industry, especially in the core 
wineries to get together uh, maybe uh, uh, three or four times a week seeing each other. Well, what board meeting or what meeting are you at next, Dave or Pat or whoever it is? Mm -hmm. uh, oh, okay, see you on Thursday then. That's the way I think a lot of things are shared. At the same time, there's outright, uh, can you help me? I remember one time, uh, you're in our facility here, when we first moved into this facility, I purchased um, uh, a new used press from uh, a place in, in Burgundy. Had it shipped over and needed it for harvest, which was imminent getting ready to start within the next week or so and then uh, tried to run it and it didn't work and then realized uh, based on some manuals and things like this that this was probably an electrical problem and oh my gosh um, wonder if anybody else uses this same press uh, Yep, uh, they've got one at Domain Druin, they've, got, they've had one and still have one at Erath. Let me give Dick Erath a call. So, uh, kind of speed up a little bit. Uh, within the next day, Dick Erath is underneath the press <laughs> changing out electrical components because he's an electrical engineer. Does he know this stuff? Yeah, backwards and forwards. Uh, does he have time to help me? Yes, should he? Uh, maybe his priorities should be back at his own winery, but the first thing that uh, you know will happen is that uh, help today from him to us will be reciprocated by help from us to him mm -hmm. or someone else who uh, he's uh, put us on to. So uh, those sort of things are, I think, uh, everywhere in the wine industry. I've been at other wineries where people have been called. I remember uh, my first harvest I actually did with Myron Redford uh, at Amity years ago. And, uh, and he, for the first time, had gotten a, a filter of some sort, and he didn't know one end of it from the other. So uh, before I left for the day, Sure enough, there was Dick Ponzi helping him out because he had a similar filter at his place. And he, once again, is another technical guy willing to get in and troubleshoot. So that's the industry in a nutshell. It's collaborative, not really competitive. Do you think that might be changing considering how how much the industry has expanded the past couple of years? I think that's a good question. Um, I, I think it does depend on whether we take seriously the communication challenges. I don't think there's a lack of willingness to collaborate. I think many times we, especially as we get more and more people involved, then the ability to communicate with each other and actually collaborate with each other, uh, it gets more difficult. And so I, I think the collaboration is still going to be there. Are there going to be some people wandering in who have no idea of what collaboration means as a word, much less as practice? Yes. Uh, but they're going to be kind of guided in the right direction. Uh, and there's some, some people who are going to come in who are influential and uh, one might think might lord it over people because they've earned lots of money in the wine business somewhere else, uh, but who are smart enough to uh, ask advice and to bring people from the Oregon industry into their family first and then ask how they might uh, integrate themselves into the Oregon industry. There are two or three great examples of people from outside, especially in the industry, uh, coming in here who have done it well. Maybe an example or so where it hasn't been done well, but I won't talk about those. <laughs> Can you give me an example of the ones that have done a good job integrating? Well, it began years ago with Domain Druin. I'm 
they came came into the area and sure burgundy should be able to kind of preach and tell people how to do things but they did it the opposite way they said this is a great region how are you guys doing things here well let us try that too uh, and then over time they might tweak it to their own comfortable area but they were a member of the family before they actually even uh, planted their first vines. And uh, I think recently the Kendall Jackson people and the Jadots and uh, uh, the Mayo Camazé, and there are a lot of different examples recently of people coming in and not, uh, not being heavy handed, but being softly uh, integrated. Awesome. Well, earlier you talked about some of the wine innovations that you and your colleagues were a part of. Uh, do you mind expanding on that a little bit for me? Um, some of the innovations uh, are um, technical in the viticultural areas or the winemaking areas. Uh, they may not seem like technical innovations right now because we are so used to them, but they were things that weren't done prior to the industry getting in and deciding they needed to be done. They might have gone on concurrently with other, uh, with other regions doing similar things because there's been a lot of cross fertilization over the years and Oregon has been very instrumental in some of these cross fertilizations between uh, different wine regions, um, all the way back to Steamboat uh, Winemakers Conference in Southern Oregon that's been going since 1979, and that initially brought people in who you wouldn't think would want to be there, um, but getting them to uh, totally open up and talk objectively about things, uh, everybody from um, from Burgundians to Kiwis to Aussies to Germans to South Africans, uh, you, you name it, and obviously Oregonians and Californians, getting together on a yearly basis um, and talking really about how to improve the breed, how to improve Pinot Noir specifically in that instance. So uh, those sort of improvements made sure that if there were uh, some innovations in one place, they were quickly shared with everyone else. The fact that we do uh, we do a lot of uh, tra trading of interns from one harvest to another between one hemisphere and another. Uh, we have a lot of people who have come through our doors. I, I think like uh, just New Zealanders, we probably have 35 Kiwis who over the last 15 years or so have come through, worked harvest with us, and gone on to do other things and are winemakers in other places or doing other things. Uh, that is not unusual. It's the way things are done in the world today. That isn't the way they, they were done uh, 30 years ago. So those sort of innovations guarantee that the technical things that happened got shared. Some of the technical things go back to uh, sorting fruit before putting it into fermenters. That wasn't done when I got into the industry. Um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of the work on, uh, on bringing um, old world traditional ways of things, uh, doing things, updating them technically and putting them into uh, our processes. That has been key. Everything from uh, native yeast um, fermentations to whole cluster fermentation, um, you name it, uh, people are still experimenting, still trying things. Just, uh, you're sitting in a, in a barrel hall here in our back building just the, the use of still of traditional French oak, but knowing exactly what the right amount is and uh, not overdoing things. And knowing, for example, we use 
10 or 11 different coopers. We could easily buy all of our new oak from one person, but uh, you gain complexity, you gain other things from, uh, from having a variable that is very influential and, uh, and tweaking it to, uh, to make it part of what we, uh, uh, what we put into the bottle, make it more complex. You can look out in the vineyard, you can see a lot of clonal work that's gone on. Uh, the innovations, and some of the innovations are how do we very graciously steal from other people, or borrow, I guess is a better word. How do we borrow from other people? Uh, Dave Adelson was instrumental in bringing in what are called Dijon clones, mainly because we as an industry saw that timing on things and the quality of, of say, Chardonnay was not the same as it should be. Uh, and not definitely not the same as uh, white burgundies, the Chardonnays from Burgundy. And so uh, in, in thinking back to the days when he worked uh, harvest there for, for a while, uh, he said, you know, timing's definitely off. And he, in communications, found out that this one gentleman uh, was a researcher, was selecting clones uh, for the replanting of Burgundy and Champagne vineyards in Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, said, uh, hey, uh, can we get involved? And in a very nice way, we asked them to share, and they did. And it's part of that what has become an international collaborative and sharing sort of relationship. Um, and uh, so Dijon clones came here. They revolutionized Chardonnay for us, and they also added some colors to the palette of Pinot Noir because we had some great, a uh, couple great clones, heritage clones that came up with David Lett and others into, the, into Oregon early on. But uh, they, uh, you can paint some great art with a couple different colors, but when you have three or four others, then it becomes a little bit more vibrant, and that's what we got with those. So the technical innovations that we've seen over the years kind of run the gamut, and they're still happening. Um, all you have to do is go to the Oregon Wine Symposium, again, an innovation that's been there for a, a long time, uh, but it, also goes through improvements over the years. Uh, you, all you have to do is go there and look at uh, experimental wines being poured or technical papers being delivered by the industry. We're still interested in improving things and, uh, and in sharing them among, uh, among wineries. I, I think it's incumbent on us as people who may have benefited from others' advice to continue giving advice. So earlier you said that you were involved with, I think, six different organizations throughout your career oh. in the wine industry. Yeah, that was at that snapshot. Yeah, right. there have been more. Well, I'm curious, do you mind talking a little bit more about your involvement, what your position was, and your responsibility? Uh, I, I don't like to talk about that because uh, that smacks of braggadocio. Uh, and, and we're all team, team members, and we work on things, and we all have various roles of progression, and especially in some of the larger things. But I, I've been involved over the years in everything from um, variety-specific groups that have uh, sought to um, get the word out both inside the industry about what the best way is of growing uh, and making certain varieties. Uh, uh, several of us would get together, uh, go into each other's cellars, have informal groups that became formal, that became not only winemaking or grape growing, but now how do we market these? So, so that's been for Chardonnay, mm -hmm. it's been for Riesling, um, uh, those sort of things always happen. Then there's the natural, let's create something that isn't there that we need, the creation of uh, International Pinot Noir Celebration, the creation of the Oregon Pinot Camp, mm -hmm. uh, creation of, uh, of other groups 
nationally maybe or internationally, International Riesling Foundation, things like that. Uh, so you get involved over, over time as much of an old fart as I am. You have a lot of opportunities to get involved over the years. And if there's a crying need for something, you jump in. And uh, that's been reflected in a lot of ways. Oregon Wine Board, we recreated that uh, about uh, 13 years ago. And for six or seven years, I was on that. So there, there's an ongoing, where, wherever you're needed, you go. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, uh, there are very few people who don't, when the call goes out, don't involve themselves. So what's one of the things that you feel is your legacy that you've left here um, that future winemakers can use? I, there, are, there are things that we're principled about and philosophically take to heart that may be deemed courageous to have been behind or may in the future be considered foolish. Uh, sometimes you have to wait for history to tell you. Um, we have been uh, ultimately committed to things, and this might seem small, but things like uh, uh, screw cap or twist off closures for wines to prevent flawed bottles that uh, when we began in the industry were uh, were rampant. Uh, we'd have 8 to 10 percent of bottles that were affected by the piece of wooden bark that we put into the top of bottles to seal them, corks. And so uh, things like introducing and technically justifying, and I, I think the technical side will be something along with a, a rather audacious sense of humor, uh, will be, the technical side will be one of the things I'm remembered for. The science and the demand for science and the nerd aspect on labels and if you've got a number that can describe things, Harry will find it and put it on a label or on a technical sheet. Those sort of things I think I will be uh, uh, chuckled about at times. Uh, so, so it's it's uh, some innovations like that. It's some pushing envelopes where people say it's not, you aren't going to make any money doing that or you're going to turn off a certain part of the market because they might still be in the dark ages thinking screw caps are, uh, are for cheap wines. Uh, not for not consider them the technically superior closure that I know they are. I I would would hope that we're known for some of the um, introductions of various varieties uh, and pushing them. Whether it is Riesling, even though we didn't introduce Riesling, Riesling was one of the the first varieties that the Oregon industry hung its hat on, mainly because it was easy to uh, pick it, uh, ferment it, bottle it, and sell it to get some cash to keep in business. And so it was deemed a cash flow wine in the early stages. And uh, at one point when I entered the industry, 24% of all of the Oregon wine was a Riesling. Uh, right now, it's about 3%. And so there's a lot of, uh, there, there are a lot of business reasons not to push Riesling, but Riesling is one of the three or four best uh, and uh, best varieties uh, in the world today. And people who ignore that, um, I think we'll probably consider us foolish by having six or seven different Rieslings and uh, investigating different styles of Riesling. Or bringing in Gruner Veltliner. Uh, there are two or three of us who now make Gruner Veltliner. 
Um, it's a variety and there are several other varieties over time that people will be bringing in as climate change comes up. Mm -hmm. Climate change is one thing that I think will always have a footnote down at the bottom. The data uh, represented here uh, was collected over the years by Harry Peterson Nedry because I'm kind of looked at as the, the climate change geek. Uh, a lot of my industry, prior industry background was in uh, statistics and a lot of the statistical data analysis tools are very pertinent in an industry like this, especially when you're looking at data on things that are critical like the climate we have. Mm -hmm. We are very well known for Pinot Noir and for certain white varieties, mainly not because we're all talented geniuses uh, as winemakers or winery owners, but because of the place that we live. This is a cool climate. Uh, it has uh, certain very positive aspects and some negative ones too. There's some uncertainty that you get by growing grapes here, especially in the old days. Now with climate change, which we have monitored uh, and kind of given the bugle call several times on what's happening with the climate, uh, we have monitored it over the years and uh, right now we're benefiting from having more more predictable vintages just because of warming but uh, what does that mean that just means that uh, you better catch it while you can uh, or you better help stop it right here so that we don't warm beyond something that we can uh, actually make decent wine from the climate as we warm will demand new varieties and demand mm -hmm. new ways of having grapes uh, that are appropriate to the area or grown in, um, in an area that is like the Willamette Valley used to be. Cool climates um, in general you can uh, imitate the cooler climate of yesterday by going up in elevation instead of planting on south facing hills maybe planting on the north side north facing hillsides there are some things that we can do to adapt and i think many of us uh, either consciously or subconsciously are doing that if people are buying new vineyard land they may be looking in places they wouldn't have looked before uh, just because they say, hey, I can grow this out in the coast range or up in the Cascades and keep going up or going to other varieties. So those sort of technical things, I think, uh, and especially some of my, uh, uh, I guess, preaching at times will probably be part of what I'm remembered for. Do you think as the effects of climate change become more severe that cooler climate grapes are going to start to fade out and we'll see kind of a new reshaping of the Oregon wine industry or do you think planning on the opposite side of the hill uh, to maintain that cool temperature, will that really be enough to make sure that Pinot, uh, Pinot Noir and other grape varietals that enjoy and need cool climates um, will they continue to thrive here? Uh, they will continue to thrive in the short to medium term, mainly because we've earned our reputation there and we will do everything we can to keep certain characteristics at the same time. Over time, those characteristics of our wines uh, may change and maybe our PR will start pushing the fact that even though when it was when it tasted like this from California Pinot Noir we kind of laughed at it now we aren't laughing anymore so the PR and the media spin may be slightly different but no I think um, most of us who are very serious about a cool climate styled Pinot Noir and white varieties uh, we're gonna hunt for the best way of doing things. In one, uh, there's some things that you can do to adapt in each year. 
in each vintage based on the amount of heat that you're getting. So you're monitoring the heat accumulations. Uh, you need to, uh, to definitely go in, into each vintage ready to adapt. Uh, but beyond that, new plantings, root stocks, availability of water, a lot of other things start entering in that we didn't really care about when I entered the industry. Mm -hmm. So I, I think we're going to continue to adapt. The final adaptation might be other varieties to replace uh, the key varieties that we uh, earned our reputation from. I hope we don't see that. I hope uh, we're all driving uh, solar powered electric cars. Did you guys uh, uh, drive electric cars here today? No, but I do have a So Prius, we're all so. contributing, <laughs> we're all contributing somewhat and we're all, uh, I think, uh, several years from now going to be able to look back and say that we've contributed to positively improving the, um, the climate. Uh, keeping the train from uh, going quite as quickly or maybe even stopping that train before it runs us over. All right, well, I only have one final question for you before we uh, switch it over to Rich and then you can have a little break in between. Um, well, my, my last question is about the land. Uh -huh. We know that um, great wine comes from the vineyard, so mm -hmm. land is key. So what makes this uh, what makes your vineyard special? What drew you to this land initially? Um, dumb luck is the short answer, uh, whether I want to admit it or not. The first vineyard that we, that we uh, purchased raw land to plant was, uh, was found 36 years ago and it happened to be in an area that was, was very far west of where all of the vineyards were planted. We got the advice that it was too far west, it was gonna to be too cool, we wouldn't be able to get it ripe, plus it was a little bit higher in elevation. But it became the first vineyard planted uh, in what is now known as Ribbon Ridge. Ribbon Ridge is a viticultural area that is the smallest AVA in Oregon, um, but it is uh, very special. It's a very special place, and we've got great friends up there on the ridge. Um, we, we have two major vineyard plantings there, and um, our reserve Pinot Noir always comes from there, and uh, other great Great varieties are there, certain characteristics. It's a, it's a great area. It happens to be ocean sedimentary soil. That gives certain characteristics that are special, uh, especially for the type of Pinot Noir that I grow and for some of the white varieties like Riesling and Gruner um, that we grow up there. The other two major soil types in the Willamette Valley. Uh, we also have covered in the other two vineyards that are our state vineyards, uh, one in the Dundee Hills and one around the winery in the Chehalem Mountains. Uh, one is volcanic in the Dundee Hills and in the Chehalem Mountains, uh, this, uh, uh, the vineyard around the winery is Lus soils or uh, glacial silt that's been blown and that largely is on the Portland side of the Chehalem Mountains, but in one or two low areas it crept through, and we happen to be on one of those little uh, out pockets. So those three soil types definitely do make it special. Soil is a key variable. Probably again, though, I would emphasize that climate is the more uh, important variable. Each vintage that comes uh, obviously is different, um, but as it reflects in a cool climate like ours, uh, that's, uh, that's the key thing that tells us we've got great wine or not. Vintage, um, vineyard, winemaker, our influence usually should be to 
to keep our hand off of the wine as much as possible. Uh, we need to be technically precise, but uh, we don't need to make a hairy wine that everyone can see as a hairy wine. They need to see it as a Ribbon Ridge wine or a Dundee Hills or a Shehalem Mountain wine. Uh, my name is Richard Schmidt. Uh, we're here at Shehalem with Harry Peterson Nedry. It's on Wayne Peterson Nedry. It's April 15th. This is part two of our interview. And so when first after This is the better part because Wynn's involved now. It's it, more variety yeah. we're going for. So in the first part, we asked Harry You're about talking. how he got into the wine industry. And I'd love to know, from your perspective, if you always knew you wanted to go into wine or if it was something you kind of fell into. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I, I tried to avoid it as much as I could as a kid, so I wasn't sure that I wanted to be in it when I was growing up, but it was <clears throat> very much a part of everyday life and um, what I was brought up with, obviously. So um, when I left for college, I intentionally went somewhere that was a little bit different. And when I graduated, did something that was a little bit different. Um, I was in the pharmaceutical industry for a while. Um, and when I came back to Oregon, because I missed Oregon, um, I decided to stay with the alternative kind of um, career path for a little bit, but found myself coming out to the winery more and more in my free time and decided that, you know, I might as well, if I'm coming out already all the time anyway, I might as well just make that my profession. And yeah, it probably pointed signals to the fact that I was very much, you know, ingrained in the wine industry. So went to UC Davis, got my master's, wanted to bring something back on my own. Um, some, you know, learning, some knowledge, some vintage experience, so I did that. So your dad, your dad uh, kind of described his winemaking kind of philosophy. I would love to know what your philosophy is in terms of winemaking. Um, mine is to, I don't know, showcase the fruit um, that's grown in the, the region. The, every AVA kind of speaks for itself. Every Every vineyard speaks for itself and um, to kind of let that shine through, but also give those wines the support that they need to be the best that they can be. Um, showcase wines that are typical of the variety. So Riesling that's like Riesling and Pinot Noir that's elegant, um, Riesling that has good acid, things like that. So um, kind of showcase the amazing place that we're growing these grapes in. And Harry, did you, did you have intention to make this a family legacy business or was it just sort of happy luck for you? Uh, having it as a legacy um, and generational business was, was an ideal but not necessary. Uh, had, had Wynn chosen to do other things then that was just fine. Uh, since she chose to get into the business and she saw some of the magic that was in it, then um, I, I thought that that was definitely something that, um, especially in, in going and visiting friends in Europe who were in their 14th and 15th generation, you, you see the continuity, you see the, the, the structure that it gives not only to your life, but also to the entire family, generation to generation. There's commonality there. It isn't just a haphazard, wherever you are sort of, um, sort of life that uh, one generation leads, it's something that is at least somewhat predicted by the business of prior generations. So I, I, I think there's a real positive to it and that when decided to also see what it might be like, I think that's uh, something that thrills me. And when, from your perspective, uh have you come in and consciously made changes or have you noticed things changing since you've been? I haven't really consciously made changes. Um, I've given my input and I've probably um, unknowingly made a few changes. Um, I really like the style of wine that we were making since I was a kid, but 
that, well, maybe not the first experimental ones, but <laughs> after we became a commercial facility. Um, but yeah, I'm sure it's slightly different, but not, um, not intentionally. Um, I think we've always shown the characteristic of the land and the elegance of Pinot and the beauty of Riesling and Chardonnay and Pinot Gris and whatnot. So um, that's I, just I something think so, I've tried to keep up with. I think some of the changes have come coincidentally uh, with changes in vintages. Uh, your way of adapting to, say, warmer vintages might have been slightly different than the way I might have. Or maybe I never saw vintages that were quite that warm, so I didn't have to deal with it. So I think part of the changes come with the challenges of the vintages. Yeah, probably. What do you, what are your, what are your favorite challenges? Um, hmm. I don't know. I like the challenge of a cooler vintage. I know that's kind of what, we call those winemaker vintages because we end up liking the end product more because it's brighter and more acidic than some of the warmer vintages. Um, the warmer vintages um, conversely end up being the vintages that a lot of consumers prefer. So, um, and they're easier. So a lot of winemakers probably like those because they can sell the wines really well and they can have a fairly easy harvest, but I actually prefer the ones that are a little bit cooler because I like the wines that come out of them. And that would be a challenge because oftentimes with coolness in Oregon comes a lot of rain. So, you know, doing your pick decisions at a, an appropriate time and making sure the fruit that you put in the fermenters is really clean. Um, those are the challenges that I like in making a great wine and a vintage that maybe not everybody makes a great wine in. How do you handle that kind of pressure, especially early on in your winemaking career, of making that kind of pick decision and, and having to then live with the consequences? Um, knowing a lot of history really helps. <laughs> so maybe, um, maybe it was a little bit easier coming into it than it would be for a lot of winemakers. But since I grew up with it and I've been around it a lot, even when I wasn't working here, I kind of knew the things that nature could throw at you or the kinds of decisions that you have to make. So um, I guess in that case, um, just learning it for myself and being confident enough to make those decisions um, and knowing that they'll probably turn out all right or asking friends or family questions about what would you do in this situation. Gray hair is valuable for some things. I might have it to even tell. <laughs> yeah. And speaking of decisions, I, I, at the end of your interview, you were talking about uh, uh, Ridgecrest and choosing choosing that land and being told that it was too far out. So, how did you how did you stick to your guns and decide that was the right land? Um, I didn't know any different, and I said, "Hey, uh, let's just go for it. I think it uh, it'll probably work out." So it's once again naivete that kind of guides us into certain areas, whether we luck out and find an ideal place or not is uh, definitely uh, uh, <laughs> something that isn't guaranteed, but we lucked out. Yeah, I might mention, because it always irritates when, uh, might mention that the, the year that we found um, Ridgecrest and that piece of property that became Ridgecrest was the year that Wynn began. So she's been here for uh, the entire history of our involvement in the wine industry, at least by about five months. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. Every time. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, outside of someone in your family, what, what, what advice would you give someone who wanted to get into the wine industry today? Either <laughs> of you, both of you. Uh, find a different career first and make a lot of money <laughs> and then come into it. I don't know. Um, yeah, I, I, think, uh, I think a lot of it has to do with the unenviable business side of things. It's uh, making sure that you can sell the stuff you make. Uh, and making certain that 
uh, if you uh, if you start, you have enough capital to do it and ideally do it yourself without necessarily having to um, having to to go to banks on a very regular basis or to enlist partners. Um, the ideal way is, as Wynn said, uh, invent something magical that generates money and then go into the business as a secondary. I would also add to that um, talking to the people that have been doing it for a long time and avoiding a lot of the pitfalls and maybe maybe experimenting with things that are off the beaten path is fun for a while but you know uh, traditional winemakers do things a certain way for a long time for a reason because it works the best so making sure you have all those knowledge tools before you get in there. So you talked in, in, your, in, your, in your interview about Riesling, and we, we noticed on the website you talked about Riesling awareness, which we thought was a, was a wonderful term. Is there, is there any kind of, um, is there, you're interested in, in selling Riesling, or, or, or growing Riesling, is, is there a, a comparable, uh, I need to wait to ask this question, I'm sorry. Uh, are, there other, are there other winemakers around who have similar kind of projects, and what and why Riesling? Why is Riesling so important to you? There is a cadre of uh, Riesling aficionados, uh, and and candidly, uh, this is not only inside the uh, the wine making community. It's also in the sommeliers and the wine buyers. The people who are most passionate about Riesling are the people who know the no, uh, the most and uh, uh, about wine and specifically those wines like Riesling that are all about finesse and elegance and brightness and acidity and food friendliness. Mm -hmm. um, we love Riesling uh, as do um, I mentioned the cadre of uh, maybe uh, it, years ago we began a Riesling group to kind of focus on Riesling because it was not being focused on at all. As I mentioned, we're down to two, three, four percent of the business in Oregon wine being Riesling. And that's, uh, that's a travesty considering the cool climate like we've got and the perfect growing region for it. So there were about uh, seven or eight of us who got together and regularly tasted Riesling and talked about it and, and uh, encouraged each other to grow more and encouraged others to get involved also. We now have something like 60 or so in, in that same area over, uh, when was it that we pulled together? Maybe 15, 16, 17 years ago, this, this group. Now there are a lot of people who see the light. Um, regrettably, some of the people who don't see the light at this point are consumers because they have not necessarily uh, tuned in to this uh, dry to slightly off dry um, Riesling that we make here gloriously in the Willamette Valley. Mm -hmm. uh, they are used to a sweet Riesling. Oh, I don't like Riesling because it's sweet. <laughs> Give me a break. Uh, uh, how about tasting it first? Oh, wow. Well, well, that's not like Riesling. <laughs> uh, that is Riesling. So I, I, I think part of, part of what we have to do is not only sell ourselves, which I think as an industry of wine, winemakers, we've done pretty well. Um, and I could name a lot of people who do great Rieslings around here from the, you know, the Elk Coves to the Trisatums to the Brooks to the Argyles to the, I don't know, I'm missing a lot of people. People who have actually gotten back into the business of making Riesling uh, uh, after a period where they've been saying Riesling's not selling so I'm not making. I mean. Uh, pioneering families like the Ponzi's are now passionately back into making Riesling. So that's pretty cool in itself. Riesling is for us a passion because it 
does for white wine what Pinot Noir does for red wine. It provides a transparent view of where it's grown. It provides long aging. Riesling can age 20, 30, 40, 50 years and be glorious. Um, and we can, we can show you uh, older Rieslings that you wouldn't believe. Um, so that ageability is critical. Riesling is itself uh, the perfect food wine. And uh, there probably is no better bargain out there at this point. We hope that's not always the case. A better bargain than Riesling is uh, in restaurants, retail shops, whatever. Well, as you can tell, I'm too passionate about it because words kind of take me. I think they're running out of tape space. <laughs> yeah, I think so too. <laughs> we'll talk about Riesling with the next tape. So that brings up a good point for me about uh, sort of consumer education. And I, I would love to know um, what the consumer level was when you started and how you see it has changed now. Consumer education? I, I think our main reason for outreach always is to educate the consuming public because once they understand why and what uh, and get excited themselves, then they're in our family. Uh, and even if they don't buy our wine, they'll buy somebody else's and they'll continue to learn. It's that learning aspect that's important. I think the consumer today is a lot better than they were, uh, a lot more knowledgeable than they were 35 years ago, 40 years ago. Do you have any idea to add to that? Um, as a consumer myself, I don't know what things were like 30 years ago because I don't really remember that time. I'm well. glad you weren't <laughs> drinking back then. But. Um, I do know that at least my peers are getting more into wine, you know, as time goes on and I can see the younger generations doing the same thing. You'll go out to a wine bar and see people in their 20s drinking wine and you're like, this is awesome. Most people in their 20s, 10 or 15 years ago, were drinking beer or cocktails or something. And the beer so. was PBR or something they, like that. They still drink that now. Oh, well, really? Okay. But it's ironic. Yeah. Well, I, I remember <laughs> when one of my... Uh, my floor mates in, at the university uh, always drank PBR even when he was brushing his teeth. Yeah, so it's, it's, That's kind of gross. it's endemic, I think. I think there are probably some people in Portland that do that. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah I, think I, see, I see a much more educated, um, younger generation coming into wine tasting and getting interested in it and seeing it as a good way to be social with their friends and do something, you know, in the region that um, is more interesting than maybe the same old things that people in that generation do. They don't just go hiking or go to concerts anymore. They go wine tasting and they explore the region right outside their doorstep. Oh, that's great. What about around the country? Because both you and I do a fair amount of traveling into the market. It depends on where you go. The bigger cities are definitely more more focused on it, um, and there are you know great wine bars all over the place. So hopefully that helps educate people. You can get a glass of something, and if you don't like it, you don't ever have to buy it again. So at least people are able to be a little bit more adventurous with um, glass pour wines and stuff. So yeah. And so you talk about traveling a lot, and I, mm -hmm. I know when we, do, we do these interviews. One of the laments that kind of constantly comes up for us is marketing. People mm -hmm. love. Bye. Everything about everything about wine. They love making it. They love growing good grapes. They hate selling it. And you talked about difficulty of selling it. So, how do you? A is that a, is that a, is that a concern of yours? Do you do you dislike the marketing part of it? And B, how do you market in a, in a Oregon market that now has seven hundred plus wineries and is still growing? It's a very good question. Uh, we sometimes scratch our heads on a daily basis to that end. It, uh, it is a changing marketplace. And if, if we were to be using the marketing techniques or understanding that we had uh, 25 years ago, uh, we would not be doing very well at all. 
Um, I, I think you have to keep current, you have to keep up with what a new generation of consumers is doing, you have to say goodbye to an old generation of consumers. Um, you sell in different ways today than you, you used to. I, I think uh, people who depend solely on the old days aren't doing well. People who, like Wynn and me, do very well in the cellar and in the vineyard need to have people who are as astute as we are in the marketing arena uh, to help us do that. Mm -hmm. I think having a long-term rec reputation in the Oregon market is good too, or mm -hmm. as being part of the Oregon wine industry. Um, reputation goes a long way, and as long as it's you know, upheld and not tarnished, it usually helps you at least get a foot in the door. Oh yeah, I've heard of your winery, and that's great, but as long as you know, the consistency and the quality is still there, and even um, some new novel concepts, um, some different wines, some different angles on the wines. It keeps you relevant, yeah. Yeah, you need to stay fresh. You need yeah. to stay relevant to the consumers that you're trying to tackle, mm -hmm. yeah. And how do you find, uh, how do you find Oregon is received nationally and internationally as you go out to sell your wine? Oregon is hot right now. Mm -hmm very hot and that's nationally especially but even internationally. A lot of people maybe 10 or 15 years ago probably couldn't even tell you that Oregon made wine but um, anybody that or knows where it was. Yeah, well yeah they still have a problem with that sometimes. Oh no, really? Yeah. <laughs> um, but at least they know that oh yeah I've heard that Oregon's making some good wines these days and even I was in Europe this year um, doing a marketing and sales trip there and you know, everybody was coming by the the table, oh, I love Oregon wines, and so people know about it. They're, they actually know a good deal about it. They know about the Willamette Valley, that some of them even know about the different AVAs um, and can say, um, you know, this is great. I, I love that you guys are actually getting a big enough community that you're exporting more and bringing these wines into a lot of new markets and you know, getting a real world view now for Oregon. Yeah, it's only going to continue to grow. And 700 wineries is a lot compared to 10 years ago. But at the, at the same time, it's not a lot as far as the world population. The entire world is, um, is basically exponentially growing um, winery <laughs> population. So it's it's all over the place. You need to be able to differentiate yourself somehow. But there are new wine drinkers every day. So. Yep. And uh, wine drinkers, even though it changes from generation to generation, wine drinkers in general, so long as you don't screw up uh, or uh, abuse them, are very faithful. And they'll come back looking for your wine if they enjoyed it the last time. Mm -hmm. So that's our, that's our challenge, is to make certain that uh, we keep a faithful clientele out there. So we talked earlier about sort of like the, the, the climate change ramifications for Oregon. Uh, aside from that, um, and assuming a, a sort of st steady change or a slow change, where do you see the Oregon industry going? What do you see the next 10 or 20 years looking like? When you've got to have a good view of this. I'm not sure I want to plant Cabernet. So I guess that means you either move to higher ground or you move up in longitude, latitude, latitude, <laughs> like a ladder. <laughs> um, yeah, you move up in latitude. So maybe, maybe Canada sounds great. British Columbia is a beautiful place. <laughs> or um, <coughs> Tempranillo and Cab Franc. <laughs> I don't know. Do you sort of see that as the as the end point? Is that, you know, kind of certainly coming? Well, if we don't do anything about global warming, then yeah, you have to either move or change varieties because Pinot Noir is good in a very narrow window of climate and we're already starting to get to the warm side of that. I don't, I wouldn't want to make it in much warmer years than we've had the last couple of years. So. Yeah, I, I'm, uh, 
I think it's a lot farther out that we have to totally revamp our portfolio of varieties. But uh, we definitely do have to stay creative and we have to adapt to different vintages, uh, have, to, uh, have to definitely do the find other places to grow the grapes, keep that cool climate aspect. Mm -hmm. uh, that's uh, in the next 20 to 30 years, I, I think we're still locked into the same varieties we've got, plus we'll probably be experimenting with, with others. We'll still be the, the new world uh, um, home of Pinot Noir. Mm -hmm. I don't see that changing. But the other varieties that we play with, Cab Franc or uh, Chenin Blanc or Gamay Noir or Syrah, you know, just uh, those will be, we'll be playing with them. So the percentage of Pinot Noir may in actually shrink a little bit out of what we make. Uh, I, I think we're still going to be uh, growing uh, very quickly. I think it's going to continue to be exponential growth over the next 20 to 30 years, mainly because as we get a little bit warmer, other places get too warm. And so people who are growing grapes or doing things in other regions, um, and I'm not necessarily just talking about California, but people like uh, people in those areas, people even in Europe, need to seek out other regions and we're going to be sought out. We're going to be, instead of 700 wineries, 30 years from now we'll be 2,700 wineries. And, you think, and, and, and that's a prediction, but I'll probably be gone to where you can't uh, come back and get me on it. And the state, you think the state can hold an industry of that size and the land can hold that size? You bet. There, there's, there's, there's a an, lot of land out there. There's enough vineyard land and we're just, our scope is basically just the Willamette Valley. There are some great regions in Southern Oregon and over in, in the Columbia Gorge and Walla Walla Valley. There are a lot of places that can grow grapes mm -hmm. uh, and they will be grown there. So on the same lines, where do you see Shehalem? How is Shehalem going to change or expand or I have no idea. Um, hmm. I don't think Shehalem will grow exponentially like the 700 to well, 2700. No. Uh, so growth in that respect, no. I kind of missed out on the, the smaller side of Shehalem when it was, uh, not that we're big now, but there was a time when it was just you doing everything. and. As I love my position, but I also wish I had more time to be out in the vineyard and wish I had more time to, you know, when I do sales trips, I get backlogged with work here. So if I could find a balance where I could do all those things and it wasn't too much, I would, I don't know, kind of focusing in a little bit would probably be fun. Or just retiring and <laughs> doing it on my own somewhere, I don't know. Well, uh, there are always... Uh uh, the capability, I mean, the 700 to 2,700 wineries, uh, some of those 2,700 could be uh, the 700 kind of breaking into three or four pieces mm -hmm. and making smaller wineries that focus on different things. Mm -hmm. so, there are a lot of different options. So we'll have four of those. Okay. <laughs> a Riesling winery? Yep. And a Pinot Noir winery? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And a Chenin Blanc winery. Yes. Quit teasing me. <laughs> uh, so, are there any other current projects you're working on now or uh, things that you're looking forward to? Mm. We've been doing a fun little Riesling exchange with some partner wineries here in the, in the valley, two other um, Riesling wineries um, that do a really great job, Brooks and Trisadum. And uh, for the last three years, we've done this thing called the triplets, where each of us brings in our home block of Riesling, presses it off, and puts it into three different stainless steel drums and exchanges it with one another. So all three of us do that, and we end up comparing the site that each person had, and you have one barrel of that, and then the winemaker's influence, too. So you've got three winemakers and three vineyards, and then you compare all nine wines when we get together at the end of the year. 
Interesting. So that's pretty fun. Um, people have been doing that with Pinot for a long time, probably 20, 25 years that I know of. Yeah, we've here <laughs> done, done that with Pinot since 98, 99, mm -hmm. 2000. Yeah, but mm -hmm. people are still playing with that, but I think this is the first yeah. time I've heard of people oh, doing Riesling. it with yeah. Riesling or even whites in general. People don't mm -hmm. experiment or play around with whites that much. So that's kind of a fun little project. You get to Oregon's really young. You get to kind of see how the same grape does in different places, but um, that's something we definitely need to learn more about. You know, being a young young industry, we're still figuring out what grows best in what places, and seeing some differences and similarities is pretty interesting. And I don't think we've seen uh, as great an appreciation of white varieties as we should see. I mean, this is a glorious place for white varieties, and white varieties, uh, still the number one uh, drunk white variety is Chardonnay. And Chardonnay is just now seeing a resurgence here. Um, white wines in general, over half of what we make is white wine. Mm -hmm. uh, so over half of what I drink is white wine. Yeah, probably about two thirds to three quarters mm -hmm. uh, for the type of things that I eat. and. Wine is for the table, so it really should be dictated by what you eat. Well, that's all the questions I have. Is there anything you have that came up that I asked? Is there anything that I haven't asked that I should have asked? Else I'm asked? sure there are. <laughs> <laughs> it seems pretty comprehensive, though, yeah. Looks like you've done this a couple times already. <laughs> we love it, though, because we love, we love the answers we get. These are just, this is wonderful stuff. So. Cool. Anything else you'd like to add? I don't think so. I think no. you covered a lot of it. it each, like. uh, each day is a new day, and uh, each, each vintage is, is different. Mm -hmm. it, each vintage is unique, and I think that's one of the beauties of the wine industry, mm -hmm. is the fact that we're linked to Mother Nature. We're linked to each vintage. We have a brand new experience every year. To a certain degree, it takes you back to the magic of not having to uh, worry about how poorly you did last school year. You've got a new school year starting in September. Oh, Don't let the bullies goodness. get you down. Yeah. <laughs> so no bullying here. No. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you very much.